It was one thing to grasp how two species of finch could become different, how their beak shape could change. That was a small step. But what about the big differences, the differences, say, between the fish that swim in the sea and the animals that walk on land? How did those changes take place? Over the years, evidence for these great transformations has been found. For instance, just a year after Darwin published On the Origin of Species, a fossil called Archaeopteryx was discovered. It had features of both birds and dinosaurs. And Darwin had seen equally persuasive evidence in embryos. Those slits in the ear of all land creatures, even humans. In us, they become tiny bones in the inner ear. But in fish, they become gills. A tantalizing hint that land animals must be descended from fish. But the stumbling block has always been how. How could a fish develop legs and walk on land? Darwin had no idea. But Neil Shubin was determined to tackle that problem. It captured my imagination. I mean, here's a fin, and on the other side was a limb, and they looked different in many ways. And I thought, well, what a first-class scientific problem to devote my research to. And I've been devoting pretty much my research to it ever since, 20, over 20 years. The first stage in Shubin's quest was to find a fossil. If Darwin were right, somewhere out there, there had to be a transitional form a fossil that was part fish, but had the beginning of legs. But where to look? He had one clue. The fossil record shows that creatures with legs first appeared some 365 million years ago. Before that, they were only fish. So summer after summer, Shubin set up camp on Ellesmere Island, just a few hundred miles from the North Pole. It has exposed rock from that crucial transitional time. The scientists' own video shows how remote and bleak the place was. It's cold. It's about freezing every day over the summer. Winds are high. They can get up to 50 miles an hour. There are polar bears there. We have to prepare ourselves by carrying guns. Oh, it's a beautiful place. You gotta love it. It's my summer home. <laughs> Each expedition was costly, but after three of them, there was little to show for their efforts. A fourth trip seemed pointless. I remember having a conversation with my colleagues, saying, well, should we go? Is this really a waste of money? This was our do-or-die moment, and we almost didn't go. But they decided to try one last time. After three days, they still hadn't found anything. Then, just when no one was expecting anything to happen. A colleague was cracking rocks, and I was working about five feet from him. And he heard, Ch -ch -ch. hey, hey, guys, what's this? Yes, it is. Sticking out of the cliff was the snout of a fish. And not just any fish, a fish with a flat head. And by seeing a flat headed fish in rocks about 375 million years old, we knew we had found what we were looking for. A flat snout with upward staring eyes the signature of an animal that pushes its head out of the water. And for that, it would have needed something like arms. What we did at that moment was all jump around, high-fiving. It was a, you know, there were only six of us in the field that time, so it was quite a scene. Back at home, Shubin and his team got to work. 
examining their 375 million year old fossil. They named their new finding Tiktaalik, an Inuit word for a freshwater fish. Tiktaalik is a perfect transitional form. Much of its body is that of a fish. It's covered in scales. But it also had something very unfish-like. An arm-like fin, or perhaps a fin-like arm. Tiktaalik had the bone structure that is seen in the arms and legs of every four-limbed animal. One big bone at the top, two bones underneath, leading to a cluster of bones in the wrist and ankle. It's the same pattern that is found in everything from sheep to sheep dogs to Shubin himself. You now have an animal that can push itself up off the substrate, either on the water bottom or on land. One obvious question was why had Tectolic evolved this new structure? One possible answer is suggested by other fossils found near it. There are large predatory fish about 10 to 15 feet long living alongside Tectolic. Tiktaalik was prey. To survive, it had few choices. You can get big, you can get armor, or you can get out of the way. Shubin thinks Tiktaalik got out of the way. With those arm-like fins, it could have dragged itself to safety on land or in the shallows. But this was only half the answer. What it doesn't show us is the actual. At Experian, we believe credit isn't just a score. It's a skill. And like anything else. What it doesn't show us is the actual genetic mechanism, the genetic recipe that builds a fin into that which builds a limb. At 375 million years old, Tiktaalik's DNA had vanished long ago. Shubin needed a next of kin, a fish relative that was still alive. What we needed was a creature that was in the right part of the evolutionary tree, but also a fish that has a very fleshy fin. So the search was on. A number of fish fit the bill, but Shubin favored one in particular, the paddlefish. Paddlefish is a really weird fish. They develop this really long snout, and they're really voracious. They eat each other. So oftentimes, you'll lose a lot of your fish when they swim together uh, because they'll eat each other. Living in the shallow waters of the Mississippi, it's also a living fossil. Scientists have spent years working out the relationships between different species of fish, and they know that the paddlefish is one of the last survivors of the class to which Tiktaalik once belonged. But unlike Tiktaalik, the paddlefish is in plentiful supply. Paddlefish is a common source for caviar, so we'd get our paddlefish from caviar farms. Intriguingly, even though Tiktaalik is extinct, the paddlefish is actually the more primitive form. Its fins bear far less relation to an arm or leg than Tiktaalik's. And because they are related, the two kinds of fish should share the same genes. So Shubin began looking at paddlefish embryos hunting for the genes that built its fins. And soon, he zeroed in on one particular group of body plan genes, called Hox genes.
Hox genes have been found in all complex animals, from the velvet worm that dates back some 600 million years to the modern human. And in all that time, the letters of their DNA have remained virtually unchanged. They are aristocrats of the gene community, near the very top of the chain of command. They give orders that cascade through a developing embryo, activating entire networks of switches and genes that make the parts of the body. They are absolutely critical to the shape and form of a developing creature. These genes determine where the front and the back of the animal is going to be, the top, the bottom, the left, the right, the inside, the outside, where the eyes are going to be, where the legs are going to be, where the gut's going to be, how many fingers they're going to have. Shubin found that Hox genes had a key role in the formation of paddlefish fins. One set of Hox genes orders the first stage of fin development a sturdy piece of cartilage that grows out from the torso. Amazingly, in all four-limbed animals, even us, exactly the same genes create the long upper arm bone. In the paddlefish, another set of Hox genes command the next stage of fin development. Again, exactly the same genes control the growth of our two forearm bones. Finally, the same genes working in a different order make the array of bones at the end of the fin. The same sequence of the same genes makes our fingers and toes. This was a massive revelation. Suddenly, the origin of creatures with arms and legs didn't seem such a huge leap after all. If the same genes were at work in Tiktaalik, then many of the genes needed to make legs and arms were already being carried around by prehistoric fish. All it needed was a few mutations, a few changes to the timing and order of what was turned off and on, and a fin could become a limb. Oftentimes, the origin of whole new structures in evolution doesn't involve the origin of new genes or whole new genetic recipes. Old genes, old genetic pathways can be reconfigured to make marvelously wonderful new things.